Hey everyone, I'm Mariana Parks, physical therapist, and today I interview Dr. Yoav Suprun, and he's going to talk about back pain myths, posture, Mackenzie flexion exercises, and aging with elegant posture. Dr. Suprun is a senior faculty with the Mackenzie Institute USA, author of the book Aging Without Aching, TED speaker, corporate trainer, and CEO and founder of South Beach Spine Physical Therapy, a concierge clinic in Miami Beach, Florida. In our discussion today, you are going to learn about back pain myths, how to maintain a derangement reduction, what are McCain's deflection exercises and when to use them, the importance of implementing functional fitness with our patients, and how to age with elegant posture. So if you feel this information is valuable, please consider subscribing to our channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up, and share this episode with other therapists you feel might benefit from this information. I hope you enjoyed the show. PT Pro Talk Podcast is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the do-anything, anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Fitter First, your first choice for the best Canadian-made rehab and fitness products since 1985. Hi, Joab. Welcome to PT Pro Talk again. Hi, Mariana. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to have you here again so we can record the episode 100 together. You were the first one, so you had to be the, the hundred. Awesome, I'm excited. I can't believe you got to a hundred people already, but this is good. You're doing great work and you're serving the PT community very well. So thank you for doing this. Yeah, it passed so quickly and you were the first one to accept the invitation. So you had to be the one here now celebrating with me 100. Awesome. Uh, so I'm, I'm super excited to have you here. And just really quickly for the ones that don't know you, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so physical therapist, uh, originally from Israel, came to America in 95, started as a pretty terrible personal trainer, didn't know what I didn't know, um, went to NYU, did my doctorate in physical therapy, understood the body better, and then was introduced to MDT, mechanical diagnosis and therapy, um, fell in love with it, fixed my own neck pain, eight months of neck pain, fixed it in one weekend, fell in love, saw the light. Studied the method extensively, did my diploma in 07, and uh, I'm a senior faculty with the McKenzie Institute USA, and I enjoy love, not enjoy, I love uh, continuing to preach what the brilliant Robin McKenzie have developed, and it's great to see our courses selling out. We had some difficulty during the pandemic, and we managed to uh, develop online courses which are still going well. But now we're back to in-person, which is my love. I love to do in-person courses. And um, I'm in Miami Beach. This is my clinic in Miami Beach. And that's all I do is MDT. And thanks for having me. Awesome. So you're going to talk about some back pain needs to get started. So first one, is core strength really the answer to avoiding back pain? So the whole thing with core strength, we, we have been dealing with this for you know for many many years people have heard about it and in the courses that we teach people always ask what are your thoughts about strengthening this muscle or that muscle here's an important thing to remember every muscle in the body should be strengthened should be worked out the goal is to strengthen the body as a whole however there are many people who are interested in strengthening their core or they hire someone to strengthen their core to avoid back pain but then as you talk to them or as you interview them in my office or in courses, we find out that they are often hanging in what we call the C curvature. And if I'm hanging on the sofa daily at the end of the day with a bottle of beer enjoying a show, I'm now basically hanging on my ligaments. Or if I sit like this in bed every night, there really is no core muscle that you can strengthen your spine to such a degree that it will keep your spine in the S curvature. So people strengthen the core, but yet they slouch. They're not aware of how to, how to really position their joints in the spine. And what ends up happening, people get up from this position with a limp or with a, 
with sciatica or with stiffness in the back. And they get upset because they've done yoga and Pilates and core strength and, and planks, etc. But the important thing to remember is that McKenzie said something very simple. We have natural curvatures in the spine, lumbar lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, cervical lordosis. We are, our goal is to try to maintain those curvatures throughout the day. If you find that this is beneficial for you, and, and when I say try to maintain it, if you find that sitting bothers you, or you develop stiffness after you sit for a while, or bending, or doing any activity that requires usage of the spine in this direction, if you find that this is painful for you, core strength is not necessarily going to help you because what you got to do is, is learn how to align the joints in the spine to such a degree that the pain doesn't treat, is not being triggered. And slouching is a big problem. A lot of people, especially during the pandemic, have worked from, you know, kitchen counters. And again, I'm treating people who are chiseled, ripped six pack, but they're spending time hours a day in this position. And right now there really is no muscle that I am activating in my core, I'm hanging on my ligaments. And as we all know, there's a phenomenon called creep and creep loading occurs within a set period of time and ligaments connect bone to bone. And then the whole joints of the spine can, can derange. We don't have to necessarily pick a structure, but we know that if we have ligaments that are being loaded for a prolonged period of time and there are certain changes that occur within the spine, people pay for it and it doesn't matter how strong their core is. So knowledge of biomechanics and what feels better after you sit is important. An example for a lot of my clients, I recommend to get either a lumbar roll, but if they don't want to have a lumbar roll on their sofa, they get a decorative bolster. You can get it from Home Goods, from Amazon, from Target. And if you do want a slouch, as long as you maintain the S curvature in your spine, you know, you could relax on it and find a position when you want to watch TV and relax and not sit necessarily upright. When you get up to go get water out of the refrigerator, you're not feeling that stiffness in the spine. So again, so core strength and strengthening every muscle is important, but knowledge of the mechanics when you relax is also paramount. So I think it means for physical therapists, so they can pay attention to not just giving core strengthening exercises and that very, very basic treatment traditional that we use to giving our patients, but paying attention to posture, positioning, body mechanics, all of that, right? Exactly, exactly. Also, there is another one that is, if it's true, no pain, no gain, or if it hurts, stop doing it. So what, what do you have to say about that one? So this is actually, as I started as a personal trainer, um, I learned that no pain, no gain. You got to push, you got to get sore. And we all know that if you want to develop your muscles, you do have to create some kind of micro tears within the muscle. The actin and myosin within the muscle, when we work out, we're supposed to create micro tears. The body lays down protein in that area. There's a whole a uh, cascade of events that strengthen the muscle. So no pain, no gain works for certain um, needs that the person want to achieve, like getting stronger. If it hurts you, don't do it. Well, it depends. Now, people ask, what, what's the truth? Should Because people say, you know, trainers like myself in the past, I always said no pain, no gain. But then people go to the doctor and the doctors say, if it hurts you, stop doing it. So the public is confused. What planet should I be on? Well, if you want to develop muscle, you do need to get sore. And there are studies that show, you know, how many repetitions, what's the goal, what's one rep maximum, etc. There's ways to strengthen the muscles. However, understanding where pain should and shouldn't be, that's also very important. So in the MDT world, for example, we talk about a well-known phenomenon that Robin McKenzie described many years ago, and that's centralization. Centralization occurred when McKenzie, by chance, sent Mr. Smith to lie on a 
treatment table and he wasn't looking inside the room. And as a result of it, you know, Mr. Smith felt the pain moving out of the leg and into the back. Make sure that you understand that if the pain leaves the leg and goes into the back, that's a good thing. This is heavily documented. And we know that when someone feels a change in the location, then the pain can, you know, as long as it moves into the center of the back, the pain is going to all obviously resolve itself within a period of time. What we don't want is someone that has back pain and they start to stretch the back and now the pain is moving down into the leg. For example, in this case, this is something I never really understood as a trainer. So when people will have back pain, I always recommended for them to do specific stretches that feel good. Okay. And actually I wrote about those stretches in my book, Aging Without Aching. And that surprised a bunch of people when I X those out. Now, I'm not saying these are bad stretches to do, but if you have done child's pose, bending forward in the shower, hugging knees to chest, the piriformis stretch. I just had a lady this morning in my office and she said uh, she did a pigeon pose, a pigeon stretch in yoga. And all of a sudden she felt shooting pain going all the way down into her calf. She was so surprised because she thought she's going to open her hip as she's doing the stretch. And she actually got worse as a result of it. And so location of pain is very important to understand. And, 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 and as a trainer, I never understood the benefit when someone would say, I'm starting a run in New York City around the reservoir in the middle of New York City in Central Park. My leg hurts. As I'm starting the run or as I'm getting into the run, in the middle of the run, my back hurts. Well, if your back hurts, as a trainer, I always told them to stretch or hold on a bench and stretch it. I never realized that some people actually need, a lot of people need to move into the pain. And so every person should get a mechanical assessment, but it's extremely important to not avoid movements in the opposite direction. Here's the problem. A lot of the time when someone does this, it hurts. And so people say, well, if it hurts, you don't do it. Well, it depends. What happens if you do repetitions of it and the pain subsides? What happens if you start doing it in a lying down position as opposed to standing up? Maybe by just starting to lie prone without even raising the upper body up. What if this is the first thing a person should do and followed by this and then followed by that. And so understanding how the body responds to movement is, is extremely important and where the pain is as a result of those movements. So for people that are not falling, we have a video that's going to be posted on YouTube that he's showing all these movements that he's talking about because he likes to move and show everything. Just so people know, he was talking about the extension progression for the ones that are just listening to the podcast and showing how to progress uh, standing and then lying down, lying prone on elbows and then press ups. He was showing his book. So you can take a look at the video version on YouTube that he's showing how he was sitting in the couch and looking at all the movements and showing centralization on the screen. So go there and, and check it out on YouTube as well. Uh, but yes, uh, I, I agree with the location of the pain and understanding what that pain means. So as therapists, I think it's very important to differentiate those types of pains. Um, so just being a muscle strengthening normal process and understanding that if it hurts, not necessarily means harm. And that there are some types of pain that are good, moving into pain and understanding how the pain should move and centralize. All those things are very important. So mechanical assessment is going to show us that. Um, and then on the McKenzie ward, we talk about the arrangements. And now after reducing a derangement with some of the exercises you were showing us before on the book, lying, starting the progression, lying prone, prone on elbows. 
So let's say we centralize, as it shows in the picture before, moving the pen up to the back. Um, so after we reduce the derangement, now we have to maintain the reduction. And that goes back to that posture we were talking before, right? So how, how we maintain that uh, reduction and how to explain that to your patients? That's a great question, Mariana, because this is really the essence of MDT. We can be amazing therapists. We can have incredible knowledge of the body. We can have amazing hands, whether you're a chiropractor, a physical therapist, an osteopath. The important thing to remember is often the damage occurs when the patient leaves our office. And so if we have done progression of forces, if we have centralized, we found the directional preference, whatever it is, whether it's sagittal, frontal, combined forces, whatever it is. The damage occurs when the patient leaves the office, sit in the car, get home, get to the office, to their office, you know, take care of their kids, take care of their garden, take care of activities of daily living. So, how do you maintain a reduction? And this is really where I really put an emphasis when I teach these courses. I put it right there for, we, we, we discuss it a lot during the courses. What do you need to do it in order for you to have a successful maintenance of the reduction? So number one, the patient has to know that every one to two hours, they need to do the reductive exercise, the directional preference exercise whether it's flexion, extension, combined, etc. Not only that, they have to make sure they're watching their static and dynamic posture. Okay, so people have to be aware of that. You know, MDT seems very simple, but there's a lot of details, and as we know, the devil is in the details. So the patient has to understand the importance of doing the exercises regularly, not allowing the pain to leave the back and go down into the leg. If you're feeling the pain leaving your back and starting to creep down the leg, you have to immediately stop whatever it is that you're doing and get it back into the back if you were a centralizer. Not everyone are centralizers. A little less than 50% of the people are centralizers, literally feeling the geographical change in location from, from pain moving out of the leg into the back. But if you... If you take care of the exercises regularly and you maintain static and dynamic posture, what else people need to understand? For a period of time, you have to avoid the offensive forces in the opposite direction. So, a simple example. We all take the garbage from underneath the sink and we tie the bag and we take the bag out of the bin and we spray some whatever Windex or Mrs. Mare and clean the bin and we put another bag in and we hang in this position. Well, if my directional preference was extension and I do not connect what I just did at home with opposite motions that are against my directional preference, my chances of quick reductions or quick maintenance of the reduction decreases. So it's very important to have a conversation with the patient. What are you doing today? What are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing this weekend? Oh, you're going to a basketball, ba basketball uh, game or you're going to a movie theater. Make sure you take the lumbar roll with you. Whatever it is that we found that was beneficial in the office has to be maintained once the patient leaves our office. And that often is what is needed. Uh, so regular execution of the exercise, maintenance of posture, static and dynamic, and avoidance, temporary avoidance of offensive movements or positions in the opposite direction, especially sustained position. Yeah, and I think that's why it gets tricky sometimes because we know that most people respond to extension so usually it's very common to have a flexion as an aggravating factor in the beginning of the, the, the treatment. So we tell them to avoid flexion for just a little bit. And then some people create this fear of flexing. And, and so that's why I think we have to be very careful because flexion is not all bad. You should not, it's not like you can never do flexion. And we know that flexion is, use, uh, is very useful a lot of times. So uh, to kind of uh, remove this McCain's idea of just extension, we do use flexion and you have to 
um, educate our patients in regards to that. So you can also tell us a little bit about when we use flexion in McKenzie and in which situation so people also understand that we do use flexion is not all bad. So good, another great question. So first of all, whenever I work with patients, and I'm now showing the Treat Your Own Back by Robin McKenzie, I say to them, listen, you will do knees to chest when the time is right. You will bend forward in a chair and do flexion in sitting to prepare you to go back to yoga. You will do flexion in standing, but there's a time and a place for it, and they will always be followed with extension. So recovery of function, that's one. Uh, addressing someone who had, let's say, five months old, they had a nasty derangement or post-surgery, and now they have consistent leg pain, consistent leg pain. They can produce it consistently in the office. And after you analyzed the history and you did a movement loss assessment, you clarify that you have an adherent nerve root. An adherent nerve root never hurts when you do knees to chest or flexion in line, for example. It only hurts when there's tension on the nerve. And so often those patients that we classify as a dysfunction subcategory A and R, the first week they're doing flexion in line to rule out any derangement there. Then there is flexion in sitting with progressive knee extension. So the person sits, they find the right load that produces their symptoms in the leg, produce no worse, produce no worse, produce no worse, until they can sit with their legs straight and then they remodel, and the word is remodel, we're not stretching, remodel that, that, that dysfunctional tissue, the ANR. So we continue with that, always followed by extension. Then we progress to flexion in standing. Again, produce no worse, produce no worse. If there's deviation or if there's buckling of the knee, then there is flexion. Let's say I had an ANR down my right leg. Now it will be flexion in step standing, pulling myself to the left to create this tension again, produce no worse, produce no worse reaction. And so all these are basically flexion-based maneuvers, right? So the beauty about really understanding MDT is it's an assessment. Once you find the directional preference, once you know what's the classification, then you can apply the right exercise. Some are extension, some are flexion, some are combined, some in a transverse plane. You know, there, whatever it is that the patient need, first you got to know what's in front of you. So we establish a provisional classification on visit one. Often you can find that, that classification fairly quickly, and you really should know what's in front of you within three visits. That's what I always tell my, my students is you really, you don't want to have a patient you don't know what they have. Now, if you can figure out what I have, I'm your patient, flexion is the best revealer. So when I have a patient that I don't find any specific directional preference or I'm not sure what's going to be the right movements for them, those are the patients that actually I send home with flexion in lying or flexion in, in sitting, and I give them the instructions to monitor certain things that might occur. But again, flexion will be used as the best revealer to find out when I'm not sure what's in front of me. Yes, and when you start talking about recovery of function in the beginning, would you just explain us a little better what is recovery of function and when it occurs during the treatment? So recovery of function in general is when the patient comes back and say, okay, my sciatica is gone. I now have just intermittent lower back pain. When I burn, I do certain things. I feel still feel tight, no radiating pain, no radicular pain. Uh, basically, four or five days, patient feels good. Now it's time to restore motion. Just like when we have a Band-Aid on a cut on the knuckle, you know, mom put a Band-Aid when, when you were a little kid, you know that if every hour you bend, the cut will open. A few days, mom kept the Band-Aid on, now it's closed. As a kid, you bend your finger and you looked at the tissue and you said, wow. It's not oozing, it's not opening. That's recovery function. You're able to start to restore motion within the joint. Same thing with the back. The back has to go through all of its available range. A healthy spine is a spine that can flex and it can extend 
and it can side glide without any restriction to motion, obstruction to motion. All those are important. There's a time and a place to introduce motion. Recovery of function is the third stage in management of a derangement. Reduction is first, maintenance of reduction is second, recovery of function is the third. And unfortunately, you are correct. Including myself in the past, I created fear and fear avoidance from flexing people. All my patients now know we will get back to doing those, but you got to stop period for a period of time. You got to lay off from doing those, especially if you have been doing these kind of stretches that haven't given you a resolution for your symptoms, whether it's flexion in lying, child's pose, knees to chest, piriformis stretches. You've been doing them, doing them, doing them, and like I'm still in pain. Well, you stop everything else, you do the directional preference exercise, you get yourself to a point where you have minimal symptoms that are intermittent, and as you start to remodel, as you start to, to hug knees to chest or flexion in lying, flexion in, in sitting or flexion in standing, people say it actually does feel better to do extension after I do the flexion. And so that's a good sign that people are ready to get back to their you know, full activity. Uh, in Treat Your Own Back and in general in our courses, Mackenzie looked into restoration of function or recovery of function in the sagittal plane. But that includes, you know, if you have a tennis player, you also have to work on transverse plane. So you have to get back into rotational movements and sport specific and speed and coordination and balance. And all those are parts, important component of recovery of function. Yes, I think that was an awesome explanation about everything because I think that's why the system is so good and, and complete in the sense that you we make the patient move in all directions. So even if they respond to extension, that's not just the treatment and that's it. We we walk them through all the directions and make sure they, they have full range of motion, no pain, no problem, no fear of moving in any direction. Um, so I think that's that's great about the, the system, the, the MDT system. And we also have the ones that respond to flexion, right? That we haven't talked much. They are not the majority, but I don't know, like in our experience, what would you say is like a, a good percentage of patients that do respond to flexion as a re reductive movement? Percentage, I would say about probably around 15%, something like that, 15, maybe 20 respond yeah. to flexion. And if yeah. you're not sure, if, if, if you're not sure as a therapist, there's, there's an important provocative uh, position, and that is three minutes sustained extension. So if someone has a derangement that requires extension, this will help them lying prone for three minutes in a sustained extension. However, if we have a derangement that the directional preference is flexion, often these people will get off the table much more obstructed to flexion. You will also see that their lumbar spine is stuck in lordotic curvature, and those people need to initiate reductive uh, maneuvers with flexion in lying, followed by flexion in sitting, overpressure, grabbing the legs of a chair or their ankles. Um, and so that's how they achieve, you know, the right, the right reduction. Yes, that was a great overview. Thank you for that. Um, and then after the patient recovers, let's say we, we reduct the, 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 the derangement, we maintain, we recover function. And you also uh, advise them to do exercise, functional fitness. Um, do you use that with your patients? Do you feel like that's important? So what do you, what do you recommend? What do you do with them after that? So it depends really on the goal of the person. Um, I'm a big believer in functional fitness because that's what we have to do as we live our life. Um, I used to put people, for example, in leg press machine. Here, let me show you a leg press machine. You know, while this strengthens the leg, instead of pressing on a metallic platform that moves up and down, uh, I like to use 
you know, the body in a functional manner. And so I'm a big believer in sit to stand, especially for the baby boomers, older population, whether you're holding dumbbells, water bottles, practicing what you have to do on daily basis into your 80s, into your 90s. Press on Mother Earth, lift yourself up. Don't necessarily, you know, get into a, a leg press machine to achieve the goal. Manage to train the body in a functional manner. Um, you know, balance is also an important component. We don't really train our balance daily. Uh, I have patients who, who, a couple of things. First of all, they are, as they get older, they tend to bend more from the thoracic spine. When someone is more rounded, their chance of falls increase because their center of gravity shifts forward. And so aligning someone's posture is number one, it's functional. Number two, it's a way to reduce their chance of falls. So in my book, I mentioned three exercises that I use daily in my, in my clinic when people want to achieve a more elegant, upright posture. And it's not just because it looks good, it's because it has a functional effect in reducing their chances of falls. So what the first one was invented by Robin McKenzie, which is what I talked about in my TED talk, and that's the slouch over correct, or if you want to call it from 0% to 100% erect. And if this is white and this is black, there is the gray range where people learn to sit a little bit at 30%, at 80%, at 50%. The, 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 the patient has to understand that there is, they don't need to be here, they don't need to be here. The goal is when you're sitting, to use a lumbar roll at 90%, you take the strain off. But this is an exercise that I encourage people to do regularly to not only allow them to understand where their spine is in space, but also literally to load their, their musculature in the back. Because we were all told to sit straight, and this is an isometric contraction. And as a five, six-year-old kid, you know, Mariana, when, you're, when your mother told you sit straight, after five minutes, all kids go here, like, I can't do it. Well, you got it loaded and unloaded. Then there is the wall alignment, standing against the wall and being able to bring the head back opening the palms, attaching the wall, the arms to the wall, let go, doing repetitions of that. It's very important for people to understand where the head should be as they're aging. No one wants to age with a head that's stuck in front of their body. And we see people on daily basis with a kyphotic, you know, curvature that's more than what it's supposed to be or more than what they had in their 20s, 30s, 40s. So the wall alignment helps people measure or gauge where their head should be. And I often tell people, you want to do it without the nose coming up. You want to bring the head straight back. And then the big one is also thoracic extension, which I love. Uh, I'm showing here thoracic extension sitting, sitting in a chair. So it has to be done in a chair that has a low back. Okay, it will hit you around the brow line. And we do that when we teach in courses B and D. We talk about th the importance of assessing the thoracic spine. But if someone wants to reduce their curvature and they tell me, what do I need to do functionally daily to make sure my posture stays upright to avoid falls? This is one of the big ones that I incorporate uh, in my office. Very good. So you give that to most of your patients? are just the ones that are getting older? Um, so there's those who come, there's people who hire me for prevention, uh -huh. but if they have neck pain, for example, I always assess also the thoracic spine because you can do anything for the neck, but if the thoracic spine is rounded forward, I am now retracting my head and I can still talk to you. When I change my posture, lumbar and thoracic, and now I'm retracting my head, you can see how much more motion okay. again in my cervical spine so thoracic spine is important to pay attention to um obviously you got to be assessed to know if if thoracic extension is the appropriate because it could be lateral for example you may need rotation of thoracic spine um but the combination of understanding number one the mechanical problem number two what the patient wants to achieve as far as a goal 
is important. Not everyone that comes to my office have pain. Some people are coming for prevention strategies. And so that's an important one. Yeah. And then I saw your TED talk when you mentioned the letter C and the letter S. So you use that analogy to, to help your patients understand about posture and how they should age. I think, you know, people like it when you keep them, things simple. Uh, and I used in my TED talk, I used C for catastrophe, S for safety, and basically moved, again, the slouch over correct that was developed by Robin McKenzie is allowing the person to, number one, gauge where they are in space. You start to train your postural muscles to hold you upright. It takes, it takes about three months to achieve the ability to sit upright. It's not like... It's not like a machine in the gym, like seated row or lat pull down or reverse flies will do it. It's first knowledge of the brain. When my patients say, listen, I am now, when I slouch, I just, I snap out of it. I know the danger of this. They internalize, when we have our conversation here, they internalize what this does to them. And a majority of them are starting to hover above it. They don't sit at 100%, but they start to play with 80%, 60%, sometimes 0% for like a few minutes, then they go out of it. They start to, to move in that gray area. And the more you challenge yourself in that gray area, the easier it is for you to maintain comfortable posture. Now, we don't know what is the correct quote-unquote, but a change of posture is often important. I have a gentleman right now, Every time he orders the check at a restaurant, what he does is he doesn't want to feel the stiffness in the back. He sits and he does, he orders the check. He does 10, 15 of the slouch over correct. He accentuates stomach out actually. And he said to me, now when I get up from the uh, dining room chair, I don't have any stiffness in the back. He loosens himself up by using the slouch over correct. So that's a great way to, you know, to, to, uh, educate a patient in prevention strategy. Same thing goes with the phone. We are all, you know, taking the eight pound weight of the head and, and looking down at technology. This is very, very important. If you saw my social media posts, a lot of the courses that I, that I, uh, uh, that I, you know, a lot of my speaking engagement, I talk about how we hold technology. And so you can do all the beautiful things to work on your posture, but you also have to change certain things. So using the phone here versus here is another important, you know, prevention strategy. Yeah, I think they're all very powerful strategies that we can teach our patients. Um, and sometimes when you educate and you talk to them and you explain them and you make them feel all these differences, then it's much easier for them to... Um, as year through the process, then if you say like, oh, you just have to keep a good posture and just leave it at that. So uh, what do you talk to your patients and what, how do you explain them? Like, why should they age in an elegant posture? And, and, and how do you educate them about that? So a lot of them are aware of how their mom, dad, grandma, grandpa aged. And so when I just ask them, you remember how mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, some of them, maybe the parents are still alive. The majority will say, yeah, my dad is walking with his hands behind his back. Or I notice, you know, and if they're pushing a walker or a cane, most older people we see daily are moving here. And we know why. Why, do, why don't we age here? Why do we age here? Because our eyes are here. And on, on average, about 3,500 times a day, we do motions here, right? So... The important is to create some kind of a balance and, the impo and, and, and to prevent falls, to allow the body to work better. If you go to any chiropractic office, you know, we know, and that's where, that's where a little bit the, the, now it's the time to start meshing together and combining physical therapy and chiropractic world. We know that everything in the body receives power from the spine, right? So, you know, our organs, everything, the nervous system stems out of this structure. This is the spine. So the spine has to be happy. Now, I can lay you down and work on your spine for you, and I can do certain things for you, but it's important for you to do things on your own because I'm not with you all the time. And so 
whether you call it, um, you know, a derangement or subluxation, whatever, there's a lot of terminology that exists in today's world. The important thing is to educate people on positioning, on what's the effect of movement and positioning on their pain. And in general, you know, walking into uh, an event or a wedding, I say to people, you know, your granddaughter is getting married next month or next year. You want to walk in with an elegant, upright posture. This just looks better. Your body works better when you're here versus here. And so you can have a beautiful Armani suit, but if you're carrying it like that, how, look, how good will it look on you versus if you're walking into an event like so? And so one of the beautiful things about Robin McKenzie was that even at his older age, his posture was always impeccable. And so that's something I always paid attention to, and we all did. And so I think posture is very important, more so now than ever, because during the pandemic, so many people sat at home, didn't go out as much, didn't show their bodies, didn't feel, you know, uh, elegant, because we were just wearing our, you know, sweatpants and people just hibernated for a bunch of years. And so it's important and relevant, at least I see it here in my office, where people are really interested in, in aging with an elegant upright posture. Yeah, so Robbie McKenzie practiced what he, he thought all these years. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and for people that are uh, looking at the video, he showed his book. So it's a great gift that you can give to your parents or to anyone that you feel like needs. Yes, aging without aching. So it has a lot of pictures showing positions, showing exercises. So it's a great resource that you can use and, and, and give to people that you love to help them age well and uh, with good exercises, good tips. Uh, so I highly recommend that. Thank you. Um, Yav, before we uh, wrap up, any other thing that you want to mention that we haven't talked, any words of wisdom and advice to our clinicians, anything else that you want to talk about? I think, you know, during the pandemic, what I discovered is there's a lot of companies around the world uh, that are now, the executives of those companies are paying attention to prevention strategies for their teams, their employees. I think we are equipped, we meaning uh, McKenzie clinicians, we are equipped with tools to educate on um on prevention, on ergonomics, on self-care, we have the tools. And so um, if you have an opportunity in your neighborhood, wherever you live, whatever country it is, if you're treating someone that owns a company, introduce it, try to offer maybe a free educational talk uh, to that executive and, and, and the three or four people under that executive. And if they like it, then come to the company and talk to 200, 300, 400 employees. You can do it virtually. I'm doing this virtually. And those of you uh, who want to see some of the virtual talks that I'm doing, there's two ways you can do it. Number one, you can follow uh, Dr. Yoav, D-R-Y-O-A-V, on, on LinkedIn. I post that. And those of you that are um, on, uh, on LinkedIn uh, as well. So I post those educational talks that I do to companies. And there's just a lot of companies that are interested in this now because they invested money in ergonomics in the office, but a lot of them are now looking into prevention strategies for the team members working from home. The, the working from home became such a big thing during the pandemic. And there, in my belief, there is no better method than MDT to take Robin McKenzie's message and teach prevention strategies, education on mechanical pain within the organizations in your community. And I'm sure if there are problems, if someone really needs therapy, those are going to be your future clients, future patients that will come to your office. So come up with a uh, educational program. And again, follow me or either South Beach Spine Physical Therapy on Facebook or on Instagram, Dr. Yoav, D-R-Y-O-A-V, and you'll see, or LinkedIn, You'll see how I do those um, 
basically right here from my office is fairly simple. If I do a virtual one, I have a large screen TV. You guys, you can see, those of you who want to see it, there is a bar stool, a very simple bar stool that I just move around. I have an ex extra camera here and um, create the right environment for education, make it exciting, make it simple. Um, and, and I'm sure it will benefit not only you, but also uh, the people in your community. Yes, I, I, I follow you on Instagram and LinkedIn, and you are always posting about, I don't know how many talks you do a week, but it's a lot. You're always posting. I've done this talk to this company, and um, I think it's great that you are doing that. And I was just curious to ask, so how people respond to that? They're excited to learn these strategies in the companies, like they they participate, like they, they interact and ask questions. They interact. They ask questions. I sometimes post the reviews also on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, um, the, the feedback has been amazing because mechanical pain is the most common pain individuals feel in, our, feel in our lifetime. And so when people learn that it's a lot of it is preventable, and if it does occur, there is a method to address it, all of a sudden like, oh, okay, so I live in California and I send them the McKenzie Institute USA and they put the zip code and they find someone and like, oh, I didn't know I have a mechanical therapist next to me. And so I enjoy and I refer a lot to people around the country and sometimes around the world for local clinicians to take care of them. But Perfect. people are interested in the prevention mechanism also. And so I think, again, post pandemic, we are the most equipped to educate the public about self-treatment and prevention strategies. Yeah, just imagine how many people benefit from simple tips that you give and resolve their problems right there, just understanding the principles of what to do, what to avoid. So that's great. Exactly. Well, Yoav, thank you so much for taking the time to, to be you. here with me. I'm super happy to have you here uh, recording this episode with me. And I just wanted to say thank you again for being the first one and, and giving me the chance to get started. So I really appreciate it and just wanted to um, say thank you one more time. Thank you, Mariana. And thank you for doing this. You're doing great service for the PT community. So we all appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.